Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Richard Keane. I'm the chair of the uh, Committee on Legal Affairs and Human Rights of the Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, before I open uh, this committee meeting, uh, there are a number of points that I would like to mention in order that those who may not be familiar with the procedures of this uh, committee uh, may follow the proceedings more easily. And there are certain other matters that I should draw to your attention in view of the extensive media interest uh, in uh, the proceedings of the committee. When I open the meeting, I will invite the rapporteur to make a short introduction uh, to the committee. I will then invite Mr. Julian Assange uh, to address the committee for 12 to 15 minutes. Uh, thereafter, members of the committee may ask to put questions to Mr. Assange. Uh, these should be questions and not statements. Initially, members of the committee may put one question. If there is time, uh, then I will invite members of the committee to put further questions if they wish to do so. Uh, should any member of the committee succumb to the temptation to ask multiple questions, uh, then I will invite Mr. Assange to answer only the first question in order that appropriate time is given to other members of the committee. Uh, members of the committee will put their questions when invited uh, by the chair to do so. I should mention that pursuant to Rule 48.4, uh, while members of the Assembly other than members of this committee are entitled to be present, uh, they may not speak. However, if there is sufficient time at the end of the meeting, I may be able to invite such members of the Assembly uh, to put questions to Mr. Assange. These proceedings will be recorded and broadcast. In addition, the interpreters must be able to follow proceedings without difficulty. Uh, consequently, I must invite those in the hall not to talk over each other, not to interrupt, uh, to place all mobiles on silent, and if there are those who feel the need to engage in conversation, uh, then they will be invited to do so outside the hall. Having set out that background, I would now declare this meeting open. As you can see from the agenda of this meeting, it is devoted to an exchange of views with Julian Assange. And that is in light of the fact that on Wednesday of this week, the Parliamentary Assembly will hold a debate on the report prepared by the reporter entitled The Defen Detention and Conviction of Julian Assange and Their Chilling Effects on Human Rights. Can I first of all ask members of the committee to indicate if they take any exception to the agenda? I take the agenda as approved. Mr. Assange, thank you for taking the trouble to attend this committee. We're extremely grateful for you doing so. Uh, We look forward to an informative exchange of views. Could I then begin by inviting the rapporteur to make a brief introduction? Thank you, Sunil. Thank you, Chair. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear Julian and Stella Assange and Kristin, I last met Julian Assange in May when I visited him in Balmash prison during my fact-finding visit to London. Today, I consider it a privilege to say welcome 
Julian, to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. I am very grateful that you, will you were able to travel all the way from Australia to appear before the Committee on Legal Affairs and Human Rights to discuss our report on the chilling effects that your detention and eventual conviction has had on media freedom worldwide. Over the years, WikiLeaks has published and revealed gruesome instances of war crimes, enforced disappearances, torture, corruption, abductions, and scores of different forms of human rights violations. Julian Assange did what investigative journalists routinely do. <clears throat> he elicited confidential information from a source and published it. Sadly, instead of prosecuting the perpetrators of the crime so disclosed, the United States decided to prosecute the whistleblower and the publisher. Instead of convicting war criminals, they convicted the whistleblower and the journalist. We must address this injustice and learn from it so that it may never happen again. I do not have a lot of time allotted to me today. That day comes tomorrow when I present my report to the Assembly. For now, I look forward to hearing your views, dear Julian, on the subject matter at hand. And I thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Suna. Uh, Mr. Assange, could I please invite you to address the committee uh, and to take let us say 12 to 15 minutes. But if you indicate that you wish more time, please just do so. There we are. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> esteemed members of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, ladies and gentlemen, the transition from years of confinement in a maximum security prison to being here before the representatives of 46 nations and 700 million people is a profound and a surreal shift. The experience of isolation for years in a small cell is difficult to convey. It strips away one's sense of self, leaving only the raw essence of existence. I am yet not fully equipped to speak about what I have endured, <clears throat> the relentless struggle to stay alive, both physically and mentally, nor can I speak yet about the deaths by hanging, murder, and medical neglect of my fellow prisoners. I apologize in advance if my words falter or if my presentation lacks the polish you might expect from such a distinguished forum. Isolation has taken its toll, <clears throat> which I am trying to unwind, and expressing myself in this setting is a challenge. However, the gravity of this occasion and the weight of the issues at hand compel me to set aside my reservations and speak to you directly. I have traveled a long way, literally and figuratively, to be before you today. Before our discussion or answering any questions you might have, I wish to thank PACE for its 2020 resolution, which stated that my imprisonment set a dangerous precedent for journalists and noted that the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture called for my release. I'm also grateful for PACE's 2021 statement expressing concern over credible reports that US officials discussed my assassination, again calling for my prompt release. And I commend the Legal Affairs and Human Rights Committee for commissioning a renowned rapporteur, Suna Ivers' daughter, to investigate the circumstances surrounding my detention and conviction and the consequent implications for human rights. However, like so many of the efforts made in my case, whether they were from parliamentarians, presidents, prime ministers, the Pope, UN officials and diplomats, unions, legal and medical professionals, academics, activists or citizens, none of them should have been necessary. 
None of the statements, resolutions, reports, films, articles, events, fundraisers, protests and letters over the last 14 years should have been necessary. But all of them were necessary because without them, I never would have seen the light of day. This unprecedented global effort was needed because the legal protections of the legal protections that did exist, many existed only on paper, were not effective in any remotely reasonable time. I eventually chose freedom over unrealizable justice after being detained for years and facing a 175 year sentence with no effective remedy. Justice for me is now precluded as the US government insisted in writing into its plea agreement that I cannot file a case at the European Court of Human Rights or even a Freedom of Information Act request over what it did to me as a result of its extradition request. I want to be totally clear. I am not free today because the system worked. I am free today after years of incarceration because I pled guilty to journalism. I pled guilty to seeking information from a source. I pled guilty to obtaining information from a source. And I pled guilty to informing the public what that information was. <clears throat> I did not plead guilty to anything else. I hope my testimony today can serve to highlight the weakness, the weaknesses of the existing safeguards and to help those whose cases are less visible but who are equally vulnerable. As I emerge from the dungeon of Belmarsh, the truth now seems less discernible and I regret how much ground has been lost during that time period, how expressing the truth has been undermined, attacked, weakened and diminished. I see more impunity more secrecy, more retaliation for telling the truth, and more self-censorship. It is hard not to draw a line from the US government's prosecution of me, it's crossing, crossing the Rubicon by internationally criminalizing journalism, to the chilled climate for freedom of expression that exists now. When I founded WikiLeaks, it was driven by a simple dream, to educate people about how the world works so that, through understanding, we might bring about something better. Having a map of where we are lets us understand where we might go. <clears throat> Knowledge empowers us to hold power to account and to demand justice where there is none. We obtained and published truths about tens of thousands of hidden casualties of war and other unseen horrors, about programs of assassination, rendition, torture, and mass surveillance. We revealed not just when and where these things happened, but frequently the policies, the agreements, and the structures behind them. When we published Collateral Murder, the infamous gun camera footage of a US Apache helicopter crew eagerly blowing to pieces Iraqi journalists and their rescuers, the visual reality of modern warfare shocked the world. But we also used interest in this video to direct people to the classified policies for when the US military could deploy lethal force in Iraq, how many civilians could be, and how many civilians could be killed before gaining higher approval. In fact, 40 years of my potential 175 year sentence was for obtaining and releasing those policies. The practical political vision I was left with after being immersed in the world's dirty wars and secret operations is simple. Let us stop gagging, torturing and killing each other for a change. Get these fundamentals right and other political, economic, and scientific processes will have space to take, 
will have space to take care of the rest. WikiLeaks' work was deeply rooted in the principles that this assembly stands for. Our journalism elevated freedom of information and the public's right to know. It found its natural operational home in Europe. I lived in Paris and we had formal corporate registrations in France and in Iceland. Our journalistic and technical staff were spread throughout Europe. We published to the world from servers based in France, in Germany and in Norway. But 14 years ago, the United States military arrested one of our alleged whistleblowers, Private First Class Manning, a US intelligence analyst based in Iraq. The US government concurrently launched an investigation against me and my colleagues. The US government illicitly sent planes of agents to Iceland, paid bribes to an informer to steal our legal and journalistic work product, and without formal process, pressured banks and financial services to block our subscriptions and to freeze our accounts. The UK government took part in some of this retribution. It admitted at the European Court of Human Rights that it had unlawfully spied on my UK lawyers during this time. Ultimately, this harassment was legally groundless. President Obama's Justice Department chose not to indict me, recognizing that no crime had been committed. The United States had never before prosecuted a publisher for publishing or obtaining government information. To do so would require a radical and ominous reinterpretation of the US Constitution. In January 2017, Obama also commuted the sentence of Manning, who had been convicted of being one of my sources. However, in February 2017, the landscape changed dramatically. President Trump had been elected. <coughs> he appointed two wolves in MAGA hats, Mike Pompeo, a Kansas congressman and former arms industry executive as CIA director and William Barr, a former CIA officer, as US Attorney General. By March 2017, WikiLeaks had exposed the CIA's infiltration of French political parties, its spying on French and German leaders, its spying on the European Central Bank, European Economics Ministries, and its standing orders to spy on French industry as a whole. We revealed the CIA's vast production of malware and viruses, its subversion of supply chains, its subversion of antivirus software, cars, smart TVs, and iPhones. CIA Director Pompeo launched a campaign of retribution. It is now a matter of public record that under Pompeo's explicit direction, the CIA drew up plans to kidnap and to assassinate me within the Ecuadorian embassy in London and authorized going after my European colleagues, subjecting us to theft, hacking attacks and the planting of false information. My wife and my infant son were also targeted. A CIA asset, was permanently assigned to track my wife and instructions were given to obtain DNA from my six month old son's nappy. This is the testimony of more than 30 current and former US intelligence officials speaking to the US press, which has been additionally corroborated by records seized in a prosecution brought against some of the CIA agents involved. The CIA's targeting of myself, my family, and my associates through aggressive extrajudicial and extraterritorial means provides a rare insight into how powerful intelligence organizations engage in transnational repression. 
Such repressions are not unique. What is unique is that we know so much about this one due to numerous whistleblowers and to, to judicial investigations in Spain. This assembly is no stranger to extraterritorial abuses by the CIA. Pace's groundbreaking report on CIA renditions in Europe exposed how the CIA operated secret detention centers and conducted unlawful renditions on European soil, violating human rights and international law. In February this year, the alleged source of some of our CIA revelations former CIA officer Joshua Schulte, was sentenced to 40 years in prison under conditions of extreme isolation. His windows are blacked out and a white noise machine plays 24 hours a day over his door so that he cannot even shout through it. These conditions are more severe than those found in Guantanamo Bay. But transnational repression is also conducted by abusing legal processes. The lack of effective safeguards against this means that Europe is vulnerable to having its mutual legal assistance and extradition treaties hijacked by foreign powers to go after dissenting voices in Europe. In Michael Pompeo's memoirs, which I read in my prison cell, the former CIA director bragged about how he pressured the US Attorney General to bring an extradition case against me in response to our publications about the CIA. Indeed, acceding to Pompeo's requests, the US Attorney General reopened the investigation against me that Obama had closed and re-arrested Manning, this time as a witness. Manning was held <clears throat> in a prison for over a year, fined $1,000 a day in a formal attempt to coerce her into providing secret testimony against me. She ended up attempting to take her own life. We usually think of attempts to force journalists to testify against their sources. But Manning was now a source being forced to testify against their journalist. By December 2017, CIA Director Pompeo had got his way and the US government issued a warrant to the UK for my extradition. The UK government kept the warrant secret from the public for two more years while it, the US government, and the new president of Ecuador moved to shape the political, the legal, and the diplomatic grounds for my arrest. When powerful nations feel entitled to target individuals beyond their borders, those individuals do not stand a chance unless there are strong safeguards in place and a state willing to enforce them. Without this, no individual has a hope of defending themselves against the vast resources of, that a state aggressor can deploy. <coughs> if the situation <coughs> If the situation were not already bad enough in my case, the US government asserted a danger, dangerous new global legal position. Only US citizens have free speech rights. Europeans and other nationalities do not have free speech rights. But the US claims its Espionage Act still applies to them regardless of where they are. So Europeans in Europe must obey US secrecy law with no defences at all as far as the US government is concerned. An American in Paris can talk about what the US government is up to, perhaps. 
But for a French man in Paris, to do so is a crime with no defense, and he may be extradited just like me. Now that one foreign government has formally asserted that Europeans have no free speech rights, a dangerous precedent has been set. Other powerful states will inevitably follow suit. The war in Ukraine has already seen the criminalization of journalists in Russia. But based on the precedent set in my extradition, there is nothing to stop Russia, or indeed any other state, from targeting European journalists, publishers, or even social media users by claiming that their domestic secrecy laws have been violated. The rights of journalists and publishers within the European space are seriously threatened. Transnational repression cannot become the norm here as one of the world's two great norm-setting institutions, PACE must act. The criminalization of news gathering activities is a threat to investigative journalism everywhere. I was formally convicted by a foreign power for, for asking for, receiving, and publishing truthful information about that power while I was in Europe. The fundamental issue is simple. Journalists should not be prosecuted for doing their jobs. Journalism is not a crime. It is a pillar of a free and informed society. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates, if Europe is to have a future where the freedom to speak and the freedom to publish the truth are not privileges enjoyed by a few, but rights guaranteed to all, then it must act so that what has happened in my case never happens to anyone else. I wish to express my deepest gratitude to this assembly, to the conservatives, social democrats, liberals, leftists, Greens and independents who have supported me throughout this ordeal, and to the countless individuals who have advocated tirelessly, tirelessly for my release. It is heartening to know that in a world often divided by ideology and interests, there remains a shared commitment to the protection of essential human liberties. Freedom of expression and all that flows from it is at a dark crossroad. I fear that unless institutions like PACE wake up to the gravity of the situation, it will be too late. Let us all commit to doing our part to ensure that the light of freedom never dims, that the pursuit of truth will live on, and that the voices of the many are not silenced by the interests of the few. Thank you, Mr. Assange, for that contribution to our proceedings. I will now open the floor to members of the committee. I would remind everyone that questions can only be raised by members of the Committee of Legal Affairs and Human Rights. As I indicated before we began, I will allow one question from each member and give the floor back to Mr. Assange to reply to each of the questions. Mr. Assange, we're not entirely familiar with the plea that you were made to enter into. And if there are questions asked which you feel it would not be appropriate to answer, please don't hesitate to indicate, and that will be understood. Uh, could I call upon Ms. Baer uh, to ask a question? Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much uh, for, for being with us, for, for sharing your testimony. Um, as far as I understood, um, neither uh, UK courts nor the, the European Court of Human Rights um, get, got any final decision in your case. I, I, on the one hand, I would like very personally to know how this feels for you, and on the other case, I would like to know whether you have any suggestions uh, systematically, legally, how cases like yours could really be settled um, in, in, a, in a legal system that works correctly and properly. After 14 years detained in the UK, including over five years in a maximum security prison, and facing a 175-year sentence, uh, with the prospect of years more in prison before being able to uh, have a shot at the European Court of Human Rights, I uh, accepted uh, a plea offer from the United States that would release me from prison immediately. Uh, the United States insisted um, that I not be allowed to take a case in relation to what had happened to me uh, in relation to its extradition proceedings, nor that I could even file a Freedom of Information Act request uh, on the US government. Uh, to see what was done. There will never be a hearing into what has happened. Um, and that's why um, it's so important that uh, PACE acts. The uncertainty within Europe as to the defences that can be used by journalists here to protect themselves from transnational repression and extradition um, if left in its current state will inevitably be abused by other states. Um, so norm setting institutions like part PACE must move to make the situation clear that what happened to me cannot happen again. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Novika. Uh, Mr. Assange, it is great to have you today um, at the um, committee uh, meeting. Um, in fact, I, um, I'm, I don't want to uh, ask about the past, more or less, which past, but past is still the, um, uh, the, uh, the, past the current. Is past. Yeah, it's not, it's not finished yet, of course. But I wanted to ask you whether you believe that uh, our proceedings here in the Council of uh, Europe, in case, and hopefully, uh, the report uh, pre uh, prepared by Suna Evas Dottir is going to be accepted at the plenary session, that will reverse the negative impact that your case had on the position of whistleblowers and the uh, right to uh, expression uh, globally, that really you hope for that, uh, that in, in case we, the, the report is, uh, 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 is going to be accepted uh, um, and your visit here to Parliament will, in a way, will um, have this positive um, aspect and uh, uh, will improve the situation in, in this regard of the, the rights of journalists and, and so on. But, my, um, um, but also I would like to add how you visualize your life now after your case. Uh, I'm not asking very much about your private plans, but in general, what, what do you think, what you are planning to do? Basically, thank you. Well, I think that I, I am here because I believe it is an essential first step for PACE to act, uh, to get the ball rolling, uh, to address the problems of transnational repression, and also to make it clear that national security journalism is possible 
within European borders. Um, as for my re-adaptation to the big wide world outside of house arrest and embassy siege and maximum security prison, it sure takes some adjustment. Um, it's not simply the spooky sound of electric cars. They are very spooky. Um, but it's the, it is also the change in the society. The, where we once produced a important, uh, where we once released uh, important war crimes videos um, that stirred public debate. Now, every day, there are live stream horrors from the wars in Ukraine and the war in Gaza. Hundreds of journalists have been killed in Gaza and Ukraine combined. The impunity seems to mount and it is still uncertain what we can do about it. My readaptation to the world, of course, includes some positive but still tricky things. Becoming a father again to children who have grown up without me. Becoming a husband again. Even dealing with a mother-in-law. <laughs> These are trying <laughs> family issues. No, she's, she's a very lovely woman. I like her, I like her very much. Thank you, Mrs. Assange. Uh, could I call upon Mr. Kleinwacher, please? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, back to a sadder issue. Um, how well, in your experience, does political asylum really work in today's world? Political asylum is an absolutely essential relief valve for human rights abuses within states. That people can leave a state that is persecuting them not only saves individual lives, it provides a mechanism where journalists can continue to report on their societies after they have been hounded out. Um, ultimately, the threat of people leaving a state uh, is what, in the final analysis, controls its, be its behaviour. Um, we have seen examples in history of states that made it difficult or impossible for people to leave. And we can see how the situation for people living there collapsed. There must be competition between states uh, to be good places for people to live and to work. The assault on asylum through means of transnational repression, it's another matter. In my case, it was difficult to find a state that would give asylum that I was able to get to. There is a big gap in the asylum system for people who are not fleeing their own state but fleeing an ally of that state um, or uh, any third state. That was my case. Asylum law does not easily cover the case where, say, an Australian is fleeing persecution by the United States. Or we could imagine 
a Kazakhstani fleeing persecution by Russia or China. I was not able to apply for asylum within the UK. Of course, the UK has its own particular political angle. It might have been difficult to convince the courts to give me or, in fact, anyone asylum in relation to the United States and the UK. But there wasn't even a chance because citizens from third states are under the 1951 convention as it's implemented in most European states, cannot apply for asylum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Assange. Uh, Mr. Honko, would you like to ask a question, please? Thank you very much, um, Mr. Assange. Um, I'm so happy to see you here, to see Stella as well. Um, and thank you for reminding what uh, PACE did in the last four years, um, uh, starting with the hearing we had in January 2020 with your father, John Shipton, uh, with Niels Melzer, the UN General Rapporteur on Torture, and very uh, important other persons. And three times, uh, I think this assembly made a clear position calling for the prompt release. Uh, and I think uh, um, this assembly can a bit be proud of it because it failed in other international state organizations. There were attempts as well uh, in the uh, European Union uh, Parliament, in the OSCD, but none of those could uh, um, had, had enough courage to, to, to make a, a clear statement. Um, not enough geopolitical diversity. Sorry? Perhaps not enough geopolitical diversity. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, that's, so I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. Um, uh, maybe a question um, on uh, the extra juridical, uh, juridical uh, um, repression uh, you, you talked about in the end, because this is one of the most shocking for me, that there is a law in the US on freedom of speech, which is not uh, for uh, other citizens, but there are laws that can be applied to other citizens. What could we do as parliamentary assembly or uh, as uh, Council of Europe, of European states, to counter this? Thank you, Mr. Hunke. Mr. Assange. In the final UK High Court case, uh, which I won and the US uh, appealed against, I won under the basis of nationality discrimination. That is, in the UK Extradition Act, you're not meant to discriminate on, uh, at trial or during a penalty phase against someone on the basis of their nationality. The US tried different tricks to get around that in the UK system, and it was uncertain whether, we, whether I or the United States would ultimately prevail. However, there is nothing in the European Charter that prevents nationality discrimination in relation to extradition. So this is a small protection. It was hard to use within the UK Extradition Act. But it's not clear that it exists in most European states. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mikkonen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Assange, that you are here. Uh, BASE has done work on transnational repression, where states go after someone in another state. 
In this case, in your case, uh, there are these very troubling allegations about the CIA monitoring and even considering assassination. Can you comment more on those? And um, how do you yourself see your status? Uh, were you a political prisoner? The first part of your question was about the CIA. The second part was about, do I see myself as a political prisoner? Um, answering the first one first, yes, I was a political prisoner. The political basis uh, for the US government's retributive acts against me was in relation to publishing the truth about what the US government had done. Then in a formal legal sense, once the US proceeded with its legal retribution, uh, it used the Espionage Act, a classic uh, political offense. Uh, in relation to the CIA's um, campaign of transnational repression against WikiLeaks. Uh, we felt that something was going on at the time. There were, there were many small signs that came together, but uh, having an ominous feeling and some um, subtly put tips from a whistleblower in one of the um, security contractors that the CIA had contracted didn't give me the full and disturbing picture which later emerged. It is an interesting example where an intelligence organization has targeted an investigative organization, WikiLeaks. Um, as a result of our investigations, a criminal case in Spain, and in particular work done by US journalists, which under the precedent that has been established in my case might well now be themselves criminal, um, detailed information about the actions of the CIA took came out. Uh, those details involved the testimony of more than 30 current or former US intelligence officials. Um, a, there are two um, resulting processes a criminal case in Spain with a number of victims, including my wife, my son, people who came to visit me, the lawyer, uh, and a civil suit in the United States against the CIA. In the United States, the CIA has, in response to that civil suit, declared formally by the CIA director and the Attorney General, state secrets privilege to knock out the case. The claim is that the CIA may have a defense, but that defense is classified. And uh, so that the case, the civil case cannot go forward. So it's complete impunity uh, within the US system. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rakan, could I invite you to ask a question? Mr. Assange, if you could go back in time, would you do everything the same? And if not, what would you do differently? I'm not asking just in the terms of personal costs that you suffered, 
but also in terms of effectiveness or impact of what you try to do. Thank you. This is a very deep question about free will. Um, why do people do things when they do them? Looking back, we were often constrained by our resources, a number of staff, by secrecy uh, that was necessary to protect our sources. Um, if I could go back and have a lot of extra resources, of course, uh, political approaches, media approaches, uh, could have maximized even further the impact of the revelations that we made. Um, but I suppose your question is, is trying to say, well, were there any knobs that could be turned in hindsight? Uh, of course, thousands of small things. Um, I was not from the United Kingdom. I had a good friend in the United Kingdom Gavin McFadgen, who was an American journalist, um, a very good man. But it took me time to, when I, once I was trapped in the United Kingdom, it took me time to understand what UK society was about, who you could trust, who you couldn't trust, the different types of um, maneuvers that are made uh, in that society. Um, and uh, there are different media partners that uh, perhaps we uh, could have chosen differently. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chope, could I invite you to address a question? You were the subject of a European arrest warrant issued by Sweden. To what extent do you think that European arrest warrants are being used as tools of repression? And to what extent do you think the rules could be changed so that they can no longer be used for that purpose? The European arrest warrant system was introduced post-September 11 with the political rationale that it would be used for the fast transfer of Muslim terrorists between European states. The first European arrest warrant that was issued was issued by Sweden for a drunk driver. We must understand that when we pick a disfavoured group uh, Muslims at that time and say, well, this repressive legislation, it's only going to be for them. Uh, inevitably, um, bureaucrats, elements of the security state will seize upon those measures and apply them more broadly. Um, injustice to one person spreads soon enough to most people. Um, I don't know uh, the statistics on how often arrest warrants are abused. Um, I was, there was an attempt to extradite me without any charge from the United Kingdom by Sweden. Um, the UK government subsequently changed the law to prevent extradition without charge. But in its amendment, uh, to the extradition legislation, it included a rider to make sure that it didn't apply to me. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Crookton, could I invite you to uh, address uh, a question to Mr. Assange? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Assange, for uh, 
all the answers to many of our questions. Uh, I am, like many of our, my colleagues here, very happy to see you here and uh, knowing you out of prison. Uh, you were imprisoned, you said rightly, for doing your job, a job that we all here expect you to do, namely being a journalist. You investigated and you published your findings. But it is shocking to me and to many of us to see how long the arm of US justice is that can get a grip on you even here in Europe. And of course, this raises questions that we will address tomorrow in Mrs. Eva Astotia's uh, excellent report. But um, can I ask you a personal uh, question? Were you aware before uh, uh, all this, were you aware of how little your basic rights as a citizen but also as a journalist were protected uh, in Europe? And what, uh, if I may add another question, what do you think will be the effect on journalism as a whole uh, from your case? Thank you. We performed a legal analysis to understand what the abilities and limitations were within Europe for publishing documents from a number of different countries, including the United States. Um, we understood that, in theory, Article 10 uh, should protect um, journalists in Europe. Similarly, looking at the US First Amendment to its constitution, um, that no publisher had ever been prosecuted for publishing classified information from the United States, either domestically or internationally. Um, I expected some kind of harassment legal process. I was prepared to fight for that. I believe the value of these publications was such um, that it is okay to have that fight and that we would prevail because we had understood um, what was legally possible. My naivete was believing in the law. Um, when push comes to shove, laws are just pieces of paper, and they can be reinterpreted for political expediency. Um, they are the rules made by the ruling class, more broadly. Uh, and if those rules don't suit what it wants to do, it reinterprets them, or hopefully uh, changes them, which is clearer. Um, in the case of the United States, um, we angered one of the constituent powers of the United States, uh, the intelligence sector, the security state, the secrecy state. It was powerful enough to push for a reinterpretation the US Constitution. The US, Const the US First Amendment seems pretty black and white to me. It's very short. Uh, it says that Congress shall make no law uh, restricting speech or the press. Um, however, that was uh, that, that the US Constitution, those precedents relating to it, um, were just uh, reinterpreted away. And yes, perhaps ultimately, if I if it got into the Supreme Court of the United States uh, and I was still alive in that system, um, I might have won depending on what the makeup was of the US Supreme Court. But in the meantime, um, I had lost 14 years uh, on the house arrest, embassy, siege, and maximum security prison. So I, I think this is an important lesson 
that when a major power faction wants to reinterpret the law, it can push to have the element of the state, uh, in this case the US Department of Justice, do that. Um, and it doesn't care too much about what is legal. Um, that's something for a much later day. In the meantime, uh, the deterrent effect that it seeks, the retributive actions that it seek, seeks um, have had their effect. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lee, could I invite you to put a question to uh, Mr. Assange? Thank you. Obviously, there's very considerable sympathy uh, for your plight in this room. I'd like to ask you about the position of the UK government about the allegation that you were effectively a political prisoner. But uh, presumably, the, the first, your, your first difficulty with the European arrest warrant was not on political grounds with Sweden. I'd like to ask you with your, your comment on the quality of treatment of the extradition treaties between the UK and the US and whether the UK is in fact bound by them uh, and whether we have very little re freedom of manoeuvre. And I'd like to ask you about your treatment at Belmarsh Prison. There's an allegation of torture which is very serious. Nobody denies that Belmarsh is an extremely unpleasant place, but I'd like to know a bit more about the evidence for that. The US-UK extradition treaty is one-sided. Um, nine times more people are extradited to the United States from the UK than the other way around. Um, the protections for US citizens being extradited to the UK are stronger. Uh, There is no uh, need to show a prima facie case or reasonable suspicion even when the United States seeks to extradite from the UK. It's an allegation uh, extradition system. The allegation is alleged. You do not even have a chance to argue that it is not true. All the arguments are based simply upon is it the right person, does it breach human rights? That's it. Um, that said, I do not think in any way that UK judges are compelled to extradite most people, and particularly journalists, uh, to the United States. Um, some judges in the UK found in my favour at different stages in that process. Other judges did not. But all judges. Um, whether they were finding in my favour or not in the United Kingdom, showed extraordinary deference to the United States, um, engaged in astonishing intellectual backflips uh, to allow the United States to have its way um, on my extradition and in relation to setting precedents that occurred in my case uh, more broadly. That's, a, to my mind, a function of the selection of UK judges, the narrow section of British society from which they come, their deep engagement with the UK establishment and the UK establishments deep engagement with the United States, um, whether that's in the intelligence sector, BAE, the, which is now the largest, arms manu largest uh, manufacturer in the United Kingdom, a weapons company, a BP, Shell, um, and some of the major banks. The United Kingdom's establishment is made up out of people who have benefited from that system for a long period of time. Um, and almost all judges are from it. Um, they don't need to be told explicitly what to do. Uh, they understand what is good for that cohort. 
and what is good for that cohort is keeping a good relationship with the United States government. Belmarsh, yes, sir, thank you. Uh, I, I, Mr. Uh, Lee, Mr. Lee, as I indicated earlier, one question from each member of the committee. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Efterton. If statue. If statue. If statue. If statue, I apologize. I'm very glad uh, and very happy seeing you, free man, Mr. Assange. That was Constantine. And um, I think that's one of the major lessons learned from your experience and the, the treatment you had is that um, the misuse of a legal process, the arbitrary application of a legislation may render it uh, a mean or a tool of repression or a, um, an incitation to silence. Can I have uh, your comments on that, please? I didn't quite hear you. Can you please repeat the question? And raise your hand. I can't see you. Yeah. I mean, what uh, comes out from your experience and the treatment you received is that um, the misuse, the arbitrary misuse or manipulation of a legal process can or may render the application of a legislation or the legal process a, a tool, a mean of repression and incitation to silence instead of a uniform application of, of law in a rule of law society. Can I have your comments on that? Lawfare is the use of the law to achieve ends um, that would normally be achieved in some other form of conflict. Um, we're not talking about simply litigating to protect your rights, um, but rather picking laws uh, to get your man or to get the organization you want to get. Uh, not justice seeking its resolution in law. Um, We've seen a lot of cases like that and ex obviously experienced ourselves, ourselves in many different domains. Um, I'm not sure precisely what can be done about it. There is a anti-slap movement in Europe, um, which I commend. Uh, slap is strategic lawsuits against public participation. Um, there is good legislation in California to deal with slap suits uh, and to reverse liabilities at an early stage uh, and to make um, abusive lawsuits more expensive to conduct. But I, I think we should understand a bigger picture, which is that Whenever we make a law, we create a tool that self-interested bureaucrats, companies, and the worst elements of the security state will use and will expand the interpretation uh, in order to achieve control over others. Um, and that's why Law reforms are constantly needed uh, because laws are abused and expanded. And so it, it needs a constant vigilance, but also great care in making laws in the first place because they uh, will be seized upon and abused. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bosic, could I invite you to uh, address a question to Mr. Assange? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Assange, uh, your appearance here is very important for the case you are symbolizing, but it is also very important for the Council of Europe to show itself as the independent institution and uh, 
uh, institution that promotes really uh, human rights and the uh, cause you represent. I wonder uh, how do you assess uh, support you got from the uh, newspapers, journalists, associations, journalist associations, and how does that, how does that, uh, what's the message about the freedom of press in your case? The support from um, other publications, journalist unions, freedom of expression um, organizations uh, was different at different stages. The, those who saw the threat to everyone else and understood the case first um, were the lawyers involved in major publications, like lawyers for the New York Times. Um, <coughs> Freedom of expression NGOs uh, were the next to see the threat. Of the larger media organizations, um, unfortunately, many of them went with their political or geopolitical alignment. Um, so it was easy to gain support. Um, from media organizations in neutral states, uh, and obviously states hostile to the United States. Um, st allies of the United States took longer. Media organizations within the United States, um, the journalists there, not the lawyers, but the journalists, uh, took longer still. It is a concern, and I, th I can see a similar phenomenon happening uh, with the journalists being killed in Gaza uh, and Ukraine. That the political and geopolitical alignment of media organizations uh, causes them to not cover those victims uh, or cover only certain victims. Um, this is a breach of journalistic solidarity. Uh, we all need to stick together uh, to hold the line. A journalist censored anywhere spreads censorship, which can then uh, affect us all. Similarly, journalists being killed or targeted by intelligence agencies um, need our firm uh, commitment in writing uh, or in broadcast. Um, sometimes there's uh, a debate about whether someone is a journalist or an activist. I understand that debate. Um, I've tried in my work uh, to be rigorously accurate. I believe accuracy is everything. Primary sources are everything. Um, but there is one area. Uh, where I am an activist and all journalists must be an activist. Journalists must be activists for the truth. <laughs> Journal journalists must be activists for the ability to convey the truth. Uh, and that means standing up for each other and uh, making no apologies about it. Thank you. Now, could I invite any other member of the Parliamentary Assembly who is not a member of the committee to indicate if they wish to ask a question? And I can see two hands in the air. Could I invite you, first of all, to give your name uh, and then to ask uh, your question of Mr. Assange? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. My name is Andy Criste. I'm, I'm a Romanian MP, and I'm also the general rapporteur for science and technology of, of this house. Um, I'm also the rapporteur on the so-called metaverse. And Mr. Assange, I would like to ask you, how do you see these new technologies uh, connected to what you have presented so far? Thank you. I'm very interested in technology. 
Um, I was a computer scientist from a young age and studied mathematics and physics, uh, cryptography. Um, it's with that cryptography that uh, we set about our system to protect sources and protect our own organization. Um, I am um, enthused about some of the developments that are happening with cryptography. Some of those developments provide alternatives to what we see as huge media power and concentration in the hands of a few billionaires. Um, they are still embryonic. Other technologies emerged out of the campaign against mass surveillance uh, through, and the big bang was the Snowden revelations that radicalized engineers and programmers uh, in many places who saw themselves as agents of history uh, in including algorithms to protect uh, people's privacy, uh, including the communications between journalists and their sources. Um, on the other hand, as I emerge from prison, I see that Artificial intelligence uh, is being used to create mass assassinations, where before there was a difference between assassination and warfare. Um, now the two are conjoined, um, where, ne where many, perhaps the majority of targets uh, in Gaza, um, are bombed as a result uh, of artificial intelligence targeting. The connection between artificial intelligence and surveillance uh, is important. Um, artificial intelligence needs information to um, come up with targets or ideas or propaganda. And when we're talking um, about uh, the use of artificial intelligence con to conduct mass assassinations, um, surveillance data from telephones, internet, uh, is key to training those algorithms. So uh, there's um, A lot has uh, changed. Some things have remained the same. There's a lot of opportunity um, and a lot of risk. Uh, I'm still trying to understand where we are, but hopefully we'll have something more useful to say in due course. Thank you, Mr. Assange. Now, there was an indication from another member of the Assembly. Could you please introduce your, uh, yourself by name? Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Sivim Dadel, and I'm from Germany, um, member of the Foreign Affairs, someone who knows Julian since 2012 from the Ecuadorian Embassy as the first member of Parliament who has visited him. So, Julian, I'm very happy to see you as a free man now in Europe. Welcome. And. Um, I uh, was just going to ask you about the war crimes. The US war crimes that you pu uh, published are still unpunished, still till today. The journalists are dead, and now there are presumably new war crimes in the proxy wars, such as in Gaza and currently in Lebanon. So my questions are, how would you advise a journalist to deal with this current situation, first. And the second is, uh, what do you think is the role of parliamentarians in this regard? Thank you, uh, Mr. Assange. I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit tired, but uh, Kristen, perhaps you want to take the the one about 
what should journalists do about the well, what can be done uh, when we have uh, horrible stories about uh, uh, targeted killings, where we are now have uh, evidence of that in in in, in, in the wars, it is uh, the reality of uh, uh, reporting on wars is more severe than ever before. And it was bad. It was bad in Iraq. Now it is even worse. It is a horror story. It is hard to give out advice. Uh, for these journalists, how they can deal with that situation. The only thing we can call out, at least, is for an outcry and, and condemnation that this should be going on, because we need information. We need this information. Uh, there are no tools to, uh, to secure individuals in Gaza that are being followed by drones and uh, are being targeted in uh, mass bombing. Uh, there is a little defense on that. But uh, the outcry and the condemnation should be there. We should not be silent when this happens. Thank you. Uh, I, formally, I, I don't want to be at all difficult uh, and interrupt, but formally, uh, a, the floor is with you, Mr. Assange. But if you're tiring, just indicate that, because I think You've answered so many questions so fully and so well. Uh, and we are at a point where, if you wish this matter to be drawn to a close, we have only a few minutes left anyway, then I'm sure everyone in this room will respect that. Mr. Assange would like to say uh, some final words, and uh, I hope you'll bear with him. Thank you. Just a few final words. Um, in 2010, I was living in Paris. I went uh, to the United Kingdom and never came back until now. Um, it's good to be back. Um, it's good to be amongst people who, as we say in Australia, who give a damn. It's good to be amongst friends. Um, I would just like to thank all the people who have fought for my liberation and who have understood, importantly, uh, that my liberation was coupled to their own liberation. Uh, that the basic fundamental liberties which sustain us all um, have to be fought for and that when one of us falls through the cracks soon enough those cracks will widen and take the rest of us down um, so thank you for your thought, your courage in this and other settings, and uh, keep up the fight. Thank you, Mr. Khan.
Uh,